Welcome to the Stoa. The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. Hello everybody and welcome to the Stoa. The Stoa is a digital campfire where we gather to cohere in dialogue at the knife's edge of what matters most. My name is Raven and I will be your host for the evening. And today we have the fourth session of a series that we've been doing with Samo Borgia called Live Players. So with that, um, I'll just tell you the structure. We're gonna have him speak for about 15 to 20 minutes and then we'll move over to a question and answer period which I will um, be emceeing. So you can go ahead and drop any questions or comments you may have in the chat and then we'll get to them during the question and answer period. With that, Samo, go ahead and take it away. Perfect. Well, um, the interesting question that's on a lot of people's minds is decline. And how do you deal with decline? What does it mean for a society to be in decline? Um, what are the options for life in a world where uh, basically, you know, the institutional opportunities that you might have grown up expecting are just not there? Uh, this, I think, is a question that's been asked many times in history. The standard rebuke uh, to the idea that things could be worse is that Socrates and Plato were already complaining about the youth being corrupted by the art of reading, how reading has destroyed memory, and how the youth are misbehaving. What this misses, however, is that there could be complaints of this type. You know, everything goes, is going to hell in a hen basket uh, or several centuries throughout history, and it would be completely accurate. If you imagine a wave, a sine wave, there are samples of the wave where it's going down every few centuries, right? So such complaints could be completely justified. I think usually there's a tendency to overestimate how much cultural change, transformation, and growth is a sign of decline. Because of this, I tend to not focus so much on direct observations of cultural norms. Oftentimes, new social technologies can obsolete old social technologies. A very strong clan structure where everyone's taking care of kin, uh, kinfolk primarily can be easily replaced with a different, more urbanized society. And morally, you might see the urbanization uh, and the arising of a national consciousness rather than a tribal consciousness as decline, but actually it's just the displacement of one social technology for another, perhaps one with some negatives, some downsides that the old one didn't have, but in inevitably also strengths because you know the sort of nation state style approach fields stronger armies, has larger economies, easily defeats tribal societies. This difficulty of ascertaining when a social technology falls away because it's no longer used or because you know it's just merely gone into disrepair, the difficulty of separating those two caused me to not really pay that much attention to some of the stuff that commentators like you know um, Gibbon in his book the decline of the Roman Empire might tend to focus on. I think I prefer to look at things that are in the material space. So urban population centers either having stagnant population sizes or dropping population sizes. Uh, economic underperformance, increased unrest, and so on. Like these kind of things, these are more objective. Now, even for something like unrest and the presence of violence, can be misleading. Uh, many very successful, very expansionary functional societies can be very violent, right? Uh, you know, if you, someone looked at the Wild West in America's history, one can perhaps have moral objections to it. One can note the high degree of violence and anarchic uh, state and fighting and so on. But if you call that a dissolution of social ties, a decline, a collapse, a social unrest, you're really not tracking reality properly. This is actually a very expansionary frontier culture. It's producing massive amounts of growth. Arguably, when the history books are written, they're going to see California, which is in a way the most extreme product of this post-frontier expansion of the 19th century, as being the most influential state of the early 21st century US, where it's very clear that Western centers 
of power and culture within the United States are coming too slowly, supply and Eastern centers. So in the very long run, I think New York will be uh, eclipsed by either Seattle or San Francisco. So violence, disorder, this kind of stuff, it's again, more objective than cultural observations, but still not quite real. Um, I think therefore the population numbers are an interesting proxy. The most advanced technologies are a good proxy. Uh, the presence or you know, absence of material production is a proxy. Almost always societies really don't voluntarily cut back consumption. What usually happens is that they're economizing on some limit. Now the resources they're exhausting might be quite abstract. It might be similar to the Garamantian civilization in modern day Libya, where they, it's the only case I know of where it, they actually ran out of you know, water, right? They had fossil water. This means water that's not part of the water cycle. They were tapping it through wells and eventually they ran out of that water that had been trapped um, underneath deep in the earth for millions of years, unable to irrigate, uh, their population dropped. Eventually, you know, Roman punitive expeditions couldn't be repulsed and the civilization vanished from the world. Now, some of the members of it obviously migrated to other parts. Uh, a lot of them just, you know, died or perished um, in these, these natural circumstances or the social disorder that followed. This decline sort of focus, you know, this very concrete resource like running out of water, it's rarely that concrete. It's a more abstract resource. For example, you could have a society that seems very economically productive, but is actually in the course of economic growth, undermining the preconditions for the high social, the high environment of social trust, which existed, which in the first place allowed the low friction on business transactions the respect for creativity, um, the sort of uh, good relations between labor and capital and so on. And you could see a total breakdown there. Um, you know, the aftermath of the Bolshevik revolution is interesting to study, but it's very clear that when the Bolshevik revolution happened, there was some sort of contradiction or inability, some kind of resource was exhausted. However abstract that resource might be in Tsarist Russia, that prevented Tsarist Russia from simply continuing industrialization and perhaps slowly or concretely, you know, in, in incremental steps or in piecemeal steps, changing their social system to account for this resource. Uh, in an important way, social reforms are always undertaken. It's only a question of how, how, you know, how high quality those social interventions will be. So a period of decline could have many, many attempts at reform. Uh, the Roman Empire in the reign of Diocletian actually saw very extensive socioeconomic reforms. The introduction of what later might be called serfdom was done in the fourth century AD. So what they did was because of social unrest and so on, they simply issued a law. You know, if you are, if your father is a carpenter, then you are a carpenter. It is illegal to change your profession. This was meant as a social stabilization measure instead of having guilds all over the place with granted monopolies, they just issued a monopoly to basically the whole economy. Insofar as these things were respected, it was supposed to flash freeze the state of the economy as it exists. And of course you might say flash freezing the economy, that sounds very familiar. Didn't we just try to do this? When we're giving companies uh, lots and lots of money to keep the books as they are, we're actually saying, no, you are not allowed to shift into a new form. You are not allowed to do something else. We are in fact paying you and requiring you to try to do the same thing you were doing before, even if it doesn't make sense. Uh, no, you know, I think there should be a real structural change in the economy in response to COVID. That I think will not happen. The high degree of social unrest that we're experiencing, it might produce positive social reform or it might not. I think we have to understand that uh, the civic enthusiasm and level of responsibility right now is lower than it once was in the United States, as is the optimism towards actually resolving some of the most pressing and very real social issues that have always been there. With the slowed economy and with 
millennials and Zoomers being the poorest generations in their age bracket ever. So if you look at a graph of how much property, how much wealth does each generation own through the course of their lifetime and you plot the generations, right? So as they acquire more wealth, as they're richer and richer, millennials go at the bottom of that graph. I'll link it after the lecture. And I think Zoomers will do even worse. So the economic game is not viable. The consumer's game is not viable. The ideological fight with the Soviet Union is long gone. The ideological fight with, uh, you know, communist China is much more complex. The level of analysis of communist China or modern day China, let's just say it is modern, right? If you call it communist, if you try to force it in this Cold War mentality, you're both missing things. And in other ways, you're correct. It is based on the theoretical basis of Marxism and Leninism and to a much lesser extent Maoism. Maoism has been arguably significantly deprecated in modern day China. However, I think we just understand it way less. In 1950s and 1960s, the West can be seen as like very strongly anti-communist, but almost all of America's intellectual elites understood what Marxism is. Today, I think almost no one understood, understands what Marxism is, let alone what you know, socialism with Chinese characteristics might be. Where are the vast efforts to try to translate these big ideological tomes? Where are these investigations of how do positions change within the Communist Party? America should be following Chinese internal politics in as much detail and as closely as the British right now follow American internal politics. But because we don't, we don't really understand the outside world. And because we don't really understand the outside world, I really doubt that there'll be a successful response there. So going through it, all of these signs seem to be there, which is not to say that there's not perhaps some social progress. And it's not to say that there's not some material progress. What it is saying is that the institutions that I see around us are clearly running out of resources. They're not running out of water. We definitely are not running out of oil, but there is some constraint that we've hit. And I want to hear people's opinion as to what that constraint is. And of course, if anyone wants to sort of challenge this, produce Pinkerian arguments, I'm very happy to talk about, say, this kind of like ameliorative view where things are getting better. Um, but I'm just predicating this conversation on the, yes, we know what decline looks like. We see what it's like. Uh, and then after a few questions, maybe I'll say a bit about historical examples of successful refoundings, right? Decline is not necessarily terminal. You could easily have, again, a sine wave or even an oscillating curve of progress if you could come up with a quantification that was worthwhile at all for progress that people might value. Excellent, thank you. So we will now be moving on to the question and answer period of, of the session. So if people have questions, statements, um, propositions, you can go ahead and drop them into the chat. If you don't want to speak on behalf of your question, you can just indicate um, to me that you want me to read it and I'll go ahead and read it on your behalf. Um, and I, I guess, Samo, I was just gonna ask you initially. So uh, even before we kind of saw all this social unrest, there's been a lot of critique of the calcification of institutions. Tyler Cohen calls this the great stagnation, um, you know, uh, Eric Weinstein talks about it as, as like the disc, um, the distributed idea suppression complex. Is there a kind of um, something necessary or maybe helpful about a kind of soft collapse that allows for these institutional structures to be kind of undermined, to allow for the possibility of something to arise that kind of addresses some of the uh, systemic or institutional calcification that we've been seeing uh, maybe since the 70s, but maybe even just uh, the 20th century in general? I think there are definitely benefits, right? There are some benefits. Um, it seems to me that with regard to pacification, right? Um, the question is, well, okay, we've reduced violence, but have we in the process crippled human nature too much? Right. There's the classical, there's the classical 19th century critique where, you know, I forget what this might be Schopenhauer, might be Nietzsche, where it proposes that, you know, how do you make an animal, how do you domesticate an animal? 
and he goes through the behavioral characteristics of a domesticated animal and notes that all of those are also the behavioral characteristics of a wild animal when the wild animal is feeling sick, when they're feeling ill, and proposes, likewise, it is with man, right? Man is in humanity, not just male. Um, this, this sort of perspective of it's good, violence is definitely bad, we should strive to have societies with less violence, um, but I think that it is also an expression of human energy, and I think we should have uh, people of high energy in society, right? For example, I think that, you know, um, this is also the reason why I think that there are some very positive developments in human history that have at one point involved, like, you know, violent elements. You can make a case that certain kinds of social evolution would have never happened without some type of stuff, either, you know, this military stuff, revolution stuff, um, organized religion, you can argue that these were instruments that were necessary, perhaps still are necessary uh, for certain kind of transformations. And with regard to a soft reset, it's a very interesting question. It's a soft collapse versus a hard collapse. I definitely don't think we will see a very hard collapse in the case sense of, I don't expect massive population reduction. Uh, I do expect some technological stagnation and I expect compounding fragility. And then you can have something that's very, very fragile, but stays for a very, very long time. Um, in phase transitions, right? Phase transitions between say, you know, gaseous liquid solid forms, maybe even between pl plasma and, and gaseous forms. I don't remember the physics quite right. There's a thing called a metastable state. In a metastable state, the material is already at the right temperature to start, say, have water start boiling. But because there's no disturbance to it, it stays in the previous transition. And then if you drop like a little speck into this kettle of like, you know, metastable water, it'll instantly start boiling. You start to have this massive amount of steam pump, pumped out. And I think uh, societies, when they become stabilized or inactive in this way, I think they're a metastable state. And it can last there for centuries. It's again, very similar to uh, a dry forest. Hopefully this, this address some of the question. Great, yeah, no, thank you, that was helpful. Okay, so let's go to WG. Would you like to ask your question? Hi, Samo, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I was just hoping you could expand a little bit on the point about what measures you do track. You said you don't follow direct measures like, you know, violence because they could be misleading. And um, uh, well, well, there was checking, right? But I think a lot of people overplay the conclusions you can reach from them. I was say, yeah, critiquing, yeah. I was say, critiquing the social conservative, and I have to say, say in ancient Rome, the the pagan would be the social conservative, not the Christian, right? The social conservative critiques are, are often very subjective. Uh, and often don't really account for there being different setups a civilization could have. And then also the, like a very narrow track of something like violence, it's really difficult to define. Like almost, I think almost everyone who has said something interesting about violence has actually not quantified it. They were actually describing almost like um, a taxonomy of when violence is, is caused in the human species, right? They were looking at cases or types of violence or moods of violence. And uh, that's more insightful. That okay, so me clarifying my position, but please. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, um, uh, thank you for thank you for that. Um, I, I'm actually, you started to answer the question that I had, which was, what sort of measures do you actually track? Well, um, I had already stated, I think, tracking population. So saying that if urban centers cease to grow and a society is like very urbanized, but it's not increasing in population, I think that's an interesting sign that something very basic has gone wrong. If you were to keep animals in captivity and they consistently had a dropping population, that would suggest that there's something really, really wrong with the captivity. It's not clear what it is. Uh, I don't think the social conservatives are right on this. I don't think the feminists are right on this. I think we just don't actually understand what causes the human, uh, the human being to reproduce or not. But I would argue it's probably very closely tied to something like optimism and general well-being and the belief that life is good, but not belief in a stated sense. It's very easy for a deeply unhappy person to say those words. It's you know much, much more implicit, right? So I would say, yeah, population numbers are a pretty good one. Um, 
technology and ability to maintain advanced technology, right? So in a way, I'm not going to say complexity is good in itself. In fact, complexity brings a lot of problems and doubling down on complexity can exacerbate those problems. There's some stuff by Tainter and so on on these collapse dynamics. I won't necessarily go into those, but I will say sustained complexity is a good sign that social differentiation is working and that there are some functional institutions left in a society. And then the third one might be, and I do actually think that uh, this one is, again, it's, it's on the more subjective side. It's something like a kind of material well-being that is accessible. Now, this might easily be something that's unsustainable, right? There are strong arguments to be made that modern consumerist living was unsustainable all along. There are arguments to be made that say in the Roman Empire, the excessive taxation of the provinces it was, is what enables the prosperity of uh, the Apennine Peninsula itself, so modern day Italy. Um, but I think that all else equal, you know, this kind of matching of ends and means, having the material means available in a broad swath of the population for the business of life and for the business of creation and so on, uh, that's, that's a quite positive sign. So impoverishment, all else equal, is a negative sign. And again, when I was talking about the US, I was implicitly stating all three were perhaps at issue, right? All three of these seem to be on the negative side of that indicator. If the light's not red on the dashboard, it's at least orange. Thank you. Great. Okay, Megan, you have a question. Um, so you're, you're asking, uh, so what resource is it that our institution yes are running out of um, to create these phenomena. Um, I've been thinking of will as a resource, or you could say ideological direction. So mm. there's a there's obviously very prominent conflicts over voting, um, not just like who who we vote for, but whether people vote. Um, that's a main conflict. Right. Um, and I'm wondering if that's also related to um, directions in music and art and things like that. Um, I think, um, like for example, putting um, putting you know satanic symbols into popular music. I think that that doesn't seem like just a coincidence to me. That's something that's really prevalent. And I'm wondering if that's something to do with um, taking people's ideological direction or people's will as a resource. Whether there's some interesting point there about will being a resource that we're fighting over or running out of. Um, maybe there's some um, some that you could take take that question in an interesting direction. Hmm. Um, well, first off, let me just address one of the claims you're making. I, I don't really know. I've not looked at the music industry. I will say one shouldn't just automatically dismiss such stuff as conspiracy theories. If one did, one would completely miss that America's founding fathers were Freemasons and that every revolution that you carry out has to obviously have in the background some real coordination. It's not spontaneous, right? For every revolution, there's a vanguard party. It's only a question of who the vanguard party is or was. In France, it was the Jacobin Club. In the Russian Revolution, it was the Bolsheviks. And in America, it was the founding fathers, but people don't really, you know, they just think of them as patriots, which is, of course, what happens if you win. So I would say that, you know, worth looking into. I don't have time for it. I don't have interest for it right now. The point, however, the bigger point that's like less attention grabbing that I think is a very good one is if will is a resource, right? Um, the ontology of psychological phenomena is a very difficult one. It actually takes a lot of like both research thinking to establish rigorously what we even mean when we talk about mental phenomena. Try to define memory. It's actually really hard. Try to define attention, try to define will. It's hard to put into words. And even if you don't put it into words, if you try to embody it, people seem to embody different elements of it. So one possibility is that, you know, humans are not the lens that can see itself. Uh, we just can't capture our own psychology because if we try, our psychology just becomes more complex. I wouldn't go quite as far to say that the art, you know, figuring out what will is, is impossible. And I definitely believe that even if we can't produce a scientific account, we can produce other useful accounts of what's happening. And I do believe that there are resources in the space of Asabia, uh, as in the work of, you know, the ancient scholar Ibn Khaldun, uh, who wrote, you know, this fascinating book on 
the cycle of desert life to city, back to desert life, where the tribes out in the desert, outside the cities, develop fellow feeling and trust. And therefore, because they're better coordinated, even though they're much, much poorer than people uh, living in the city, they can easily overtake the city, become new elites. However, the children of these desert nomads find themselves again in the city, quite wealthy. But if you're in the city, your main competitor are other rich city dwellers. It's no longer you know, the harsh environment or the other tribes. So over time, that goes away. That's a generational level. But I think you were also perhaps thinking of something more direct, like morale. Uh, in military science, it's like very, very clear that morale is an extremely important resource. So in the military sense, morale means something like this, this ability, willingness to, to carry out mission, this coordinative ability, this positive spirit. In fact, if you read all the literature on it, they don't have a precise definition either and start sounding an awful lot like will. The idea that two armies fighting is primarily a contest of willpower is something that both like, you know, uh, you know, ancient strategists of Greece and the ancient strategists of China agreed on. And today, these terms like psychological warfare suggest even modern theorists agree with it. So yeah, I think the deployment of something like will and the fracturing of will against each other is, is real. I think that there are more subtle things also happening. I think I would, for example, describe hope, right? Hope versus nihilism where deeply felt justified hope seems to be one of the most important preconditions for human life. Where I would argue again that, you know, and then is hope and will the same thing? Well, Nietzschean would say yes. I'm not sure I would say quite yes, uh, but there's, there's stuff to discuss there. And if this is the resource that's lacking, then you would perhaps, I'm just curious, are you any familiar with, a con with like Spengler's concept of a Faustian civilization? You might enjoy reading that because that proposed, you know, the, the, the legend, the myth of Faust is, you know, strikes a bargain basically with the devil. You know, I will know all the secrets of the world. I will be immensely attractive. I will experience every physical pleasure and so on. All it takes is my mortal soul. Now, at the end of the very end of the story, there's a loophole. Uh, the person gets out of the bargain. But the analysis is that perhaps Western civilization two or 300 years ago set its course on this kind of Faustian bargain. Um, and he contrasts this with what he calls the Magian civilization, where he takes ancient Christianity and Islam to be actually part of the same civilization with a completely different mindset. And before that, I think he has the Apollonic civilization. So there's definitely a lot of very interesting theoretical work on these topics, and it's worth reading. Um, and I would say that I don't get the impression that 1960s America was primarily driven by at least overt willpower. So I don't think that's quite it. And it seems like World War II America is not driven mostly by willpower. Though again, willpower can like be described in other ways. So at least, at least for the US, I, I would incline against this answer. That was, that was fun. That was a great question. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Niran, would you like to ask your question? Sure. Uh, so you mentioned earlier that uh, Americans should be paying attention to internal Chinese politics just as much as British people pay attention to internal American politics, but it doesn't really seem to be something that happens. Uh, do you see that as like a lack of demand? Are we just uninterested to focus on ourselves? Or do you see it as a lack of access for journalists to actually be able to get that information back across? Those. That's an excellent question. Um, I think that I think that we would do very well to just start translating the documents that they put out and examining them critically, because there's a massive, massive amount of documentation released uh, by the Chinese government and by everyday Chinese citizens every day. We don't have enough educated Chinese speakers who are also uh, educated in political science or focused significantly on the Chinese system. I think that there is demand for now, or there is demand to read about China. I think if our public discourse was of a higher quality, there would be more demand to read deeply on China. It's actually extremely important to understand both strategic partners and strategic rivals. 
we could be reading at least as much in detail about China as we are about Europe. I think there's at least that much demand in say contemporary American society. And I say this as a European, right? I've only, you know, I've only lived in the US for something like five years. Um, and it seems to me there that the bottleneck is on the education side. I think there's just far too few people that speak Chinese and there is far too little of the initial organization. I bet if there was a magazine that focused on translating articles from China, uh, they could get funding. I bet they could make a strong pitch if they had a few good scholars. And I think they would be cited widely uh, by outlets. Uh, like, you know, I think the New York Times would cite them. I think, you know, the Atlantic would cite them. I think the national interests like Palladium, whichever outlet you think, they would be very happy to have such material. So I think it's it's a, it's, a, um, uh, it's a staffing problem. I was just considering that, you know, the very, the very first um, Japanese state transatlantic visit in I think the 1860s, uh, where the biggest barrier was just finding enough people in Japan who spoke English to go on a, on a steamboat and go all over the San Francisco and see what America is like, right, a few years after. Commodore Perry forcefully uh, forced, forced and kind of humiliated Japan by forcing them to trade. Now, in a lot of accounts, this is presented as completely reasonable. I've written an article on why actually trade is far more ambiguous, is not always positive. Uh, but I think that we are sort of like, you know, maybe America should be like this. Maybe we should send a steamboat over to China and have on board all the people that can speak Chinese and have them live in China for six months if the Chinese government allows it, and then they can write to us what they see. Uh, I think there's, we should be at least that open to understanding the culture. Great. Thank you. Maybe Gray, would you like to ask your question? Hi, Samo. So nice to see you again this week. Um, <laughs> I was really lighting up when you were talking about uh, domestication and captivity and the way that we don't really fully understand why there's something wrong with it, but that we definitely know that there's a lot of harm that comes from it. So I would just love to hear you say more about what would be bad about fully domesticating humanity. Yeah, I mean, again, it's an intuition to explore. Um, I think that well, perhaps for starters, like there's the observation that wild wolves have about 30% more brain mass than domesticated dogs. So in other words, I bet the dogs are not thinking for themselves as much as the wolves are. And I think that, you know, all of these, in a simplistic way, the critique of, of imitation or the critique of groupthink, it's, it's a very strong critique, right? So I think if we become overly domesticated, will become too consensus oriented and we will perhaps even as a whole species miss important options. So it's not good from a survival perspective, but then from a thriving perspective, I think it's bad because it suggests that full stop, we have less motivation to do things, right? If you slow down a computer by 50% and then say, good news, this computer lasts twice as long, I don't think you've really done anything worth bragging, right? It's sort of like a candle, it's burning more, less brightly and it lasts longer. It doesn't seem very useful. So if the answer is that, you know, say the only way we can avoid this existential risk to humanity is to just make us much lower, lower energy as individuals. And then the macro structure won't be put under the kind of pressures that might lead to, you know, nuclear war or the wrong kind of technological advancements. In that case, I'm sort of like, no, no, don't slow it down. Right. Let's go. Let's go boldly there and see what happens. Awesome. Thanks so much. All right. We have Dan. Uh, okay. So what's the, what's the question there? It, it, this is with regard to um, energy return on investment. Is this the question that you would like me to ask? Um, I guess Samo, you were talking several, you know, the, the sinusoidal ups and downs of society. Yeah, there's one possibility. One yeah. possibility. Well, it, I mean, it, um, I, I think Bogdanov, Bogdanov uh, has written extensively on this. Peter Turchin has written about 
Clio dynamics and things of this. So nature. they disagree on the details of the models and of course, where exactly. Yes. And the Kudrachev, if you know the Kudrachev macroeconomic waves, they also propose that sort of sort of structure. Right. They all look at it from a different perspective and a lens. Um, but one of the inter on a more practical, numerical, quantif quantifiable level, uh, mm -hmm. not so much a cultural level. Uh, uh, Joseph Tainer in his book, uh, The Collapse of uh, like societies. Complex Societies, and then Thomas Homer Dixon, to earlier. Yes. Um, they talk about this energy return on investment. So one of the things that people are looking at is, the, is for example, looking at uh, on the basis of uh, the Club of Rome's The Limits of Growth book, mm -hmm. that essentially when a society, when the cost of uh, energy, in, in this case, fossil fuel in our industrial economies, when that starts, um, it gets to it, you hit peak. When you hit peak oil or peak, peak coal, when it becomes more and more expensive to extract that source of energy from the ground, where it, it costs more to pull it out of the ground than you actually get out of it, then the society starts tanking at that point. And we're, I think it was like 2005 in some cases in some parts of the world, 2010, we were hitting mm -hmm. peak coal, peak oil and this sort of stuff. So I think that's coming to play. And also I think another factor, which is, I'm intuiting that there's some relationship to it, but not very direct that in the early 1970s, there was another inflection point, which was, um, it was the first time in US history after 150 years that uh, the US overcame its, its persistent labor shortage, which allowed for the citizenry of the US to have rising wages, which will kind of overcame all of the, let's say embedded inequities that were embedded into the culture. They, they could essentially, you know, okay, my life is getting better for the majority, at least economically, even though I'm suffering from all of this crap. And, and after the 1970s that ended, so it allowed all those problems to kind of come to the surface. And I'm gonna shut up now. And I'm wondering what- That was to say about actually that. a good exposition. The key issue here is that there's so many confounding variables for the 1970s, right? You have like, you can propose that it's the energy there are people who propose it's the like replacement of the currency system. There are people who propose that that's like when, you know, the demographic crash starts hitting and that actually society was always a Ponzi scheme and you needed societies that are heavy on young people and light on old people because old people are too conservative and rigid. Um, and like, I think the return on energy investment is a very good measure. I don't think it's what's happening right now, partially because there seem to be a lot of energy sources that could be used that could generate very good returns that aren't like like we not we've not hit peak oil right more than a crash in oil supply we've seen a crash in oil demand and that's unusual right that's very unusual i actually am very sympathetic to the sort of basically like club of rome style peak oil arguments because they just seem to be actually completely correct on the basis of the fundamentals it's just that the concrete projections haven't met what we are seeing right now. Perhaps right now we have some different kind of crisis and then in the future, later in the 21st century, we actually start running into issues when we run out of you know, uranium and oil. We don't seem to have been running out of oil right now, right? So um, there, there have to be at least some additional types of crises that are not energy crises. Cool, next question. Yeah, I actually have one. Um, Perfect. Uh, so I have, is the declining resource somehow related to the proportion of live players to dead players in a society? I think that it must be. Um, so this is one of the reasons why I was actually fairly sympathetic to the question about will and also the question of domestication and so on. Uh, it could be that overly domesticated humans actually just make for very bad live players without some sort of burst of energy and observation, you go to the lowest energy action. The lowest energy action is doing what you have always been doing or what you've been taught to do or what everyone else around you is doing. Now, of course, the vast majority of things you could do or could try to innovate are worse 
than what everyone's doing around you. So there's also like a locally rational argument to be that way, right? Um, but if no one's doing it, then, you know, not enough experimentation and not enough learning. If you never do something outside the norm, you can't really know why the norm is there now, can you? At least not on the basis of personal experience, perhaps on the basis of wisdom of people you deeply trust. And that's important. Um, but I would actually argue that if you want to dream up a new social order or way of being, you actually have to live through a few of them, right? You have to experience a few of them. A few people could object to me saying that, you know, Joseph Smith had a colorful life. Or if we take, you know, the Prophet Muhammad, that he had a colorful life, or that Jesus had a colorful life. And if they didn't have these unusual lives where they were like, you know, debating the religious scholars while they were 12 or something, right? Or, you know, let's be generous, like engaging in what's basically sounds like a treasure hunt scam. They wouldn't have learned things about human nature that are just needed, right? Or at least the truths about human nature most salient to the world, which they lived in at the time. I'm again still pausing this deep psychological complexity where it's like very difficult to be self-reflective in that way, possibly impossible. Um, the live player decline though might be a consequence. My own theories related to great founder theory, related to you know subcomponents of empire theory, stuff related to players, stuff related to traditions of knowledge. I obviously think that's like very explanatory and very much worth pursuing. But the question I'm asking like doesn't really rely on it and I'm open to other answers. This is not the first like paradigm of history I've gone into, right? I was extremely interested in uh, Peter Turchin's work around 2014, 2015. A lot of people right now are giving him credit that he got 2020 right. Um, I'm not sure he did. I would, I would say argue that 2020, the unrest is un revealing underlying problems, but the the protest movement and you know the demonstrations and so on would not have been uh, as big a deal had the plague not struck and you know the covid cry covid is not downstream of social effects it's a biological effect i'm sure there are social effects that were risk factors for covid evolving but since i think it's covid driven i, I actually think 2020 is a lucky guess on on turchin's part but i deeply respect his work I think his uh, Cleodynamics project is an extremely interesting one. And before that, I've also like, you know, read all of these books on the Club of Rome stuff and say the kind of stuff that was popularized by Jared Diamond in his book Collapse. Um, so, you know, I don't expect this to be my final theory of the world. Right now on it, I would answer yes, but it's a qualified yes. I'd put like 60% probability on it and then split the rest between some other theories and undiscovered theories. Thank you. All right, Anjan, your questions. Um, hey, Simon. Uh, Eric Weinstein hey. has this interesting thing where he talks about medium male income and since the 1970s, how it flatlines. And I know you were riffing about that. I was wondering if you just continue to elaborate, like what do you think changed? Because you have, as you're saying, so many confounding variables. Do you think there's an attractor behind them all or yeah, just kind of, if you had any thoughts around that. Yeah, it's a very, it's an interesting and difficult economic question because we can't actually analyze wages just as economic facts. The reality is that having a job is a deeply socially important action. Perhaps the real tribalism of modern America is the tribalism of being employed, right? I am a member of this community. I am judged by these behavioral standards. If my boss fires me for misbehavior, others will see this and will know that I'm a sketchy person. Like this is definitely like, it plays such a social regulatory role to say, what do you do? What is your job? It's perhaps not relevant to say 5% of the population, 10%. It's certainly relevant for 60% or 70% of the population. They feel defined by their jobs, right? So when we say, medium income has stagnated, you also have to measure the income. I think we should be very skeptical of the inflation numbers that we're seeing. I think it's possible inflation is far higher. I think it's also possible that there was growth that was not captured by the numbers. Let's remember mainstream economic orthodoxy in the 1990s was that there have been such vast increases in productivity due to the introduction of the internet and so on 
that the old numbers are not capturing at all and that the old the the statistics used from the 50s 60s 70s that are showing relative stagnation are actually hiding the vast increases in living standards um, this view occasionally returns and i think it's still a view that's basically believed within silicon valley there are some people in silicon valley who might believe an alternate version who are like well you know the internets make everything so much more productive that we've automated away all the jobs. And now really the problem is that our technology is so great that there's nothing for anyone to do and we need to transition from jobs to UBI. The problem is UBI is meaningless, literally. Like you, you, you will not find meaning on UBI unless you did a much more radical re-engineering of the entire culture. The Yang Gang idea of give everyone a thousand dollars every month without providing them with an alternate primary social identity that's not their work it's like, it's not even a half done revolution. It's like, it's like sort of, it's like taking the wheel, taking one tire out of a driving car. Like maybe the car can continue to drive on three wheels, maybe, or maybe you're just gonna crash it really bad, right? Um, so I feel that here's an interesting and contrarian idea. Maybe something about the way jobs are social roles for people necessitate in the very concept of having a job a certain level of inequality so what happened in the 70s was the social roles hit their limits and it was simply not possible to pay people more while maintaining the social differentiation that the jobs require so in order i'm say proposing that there's something like inherently tied to economic inequality that is needed to make the roles of having a job fit each other neatly and at hitting these limits, you know, the, econ the economy bends to make the culture fit. So that would be maybe my proposal there. And it's, it's again, that's, that's more of a hypothesis I would put like 20% 20 20 weight on, but definitely 20%. It's not like a 2% hypothesis. Pat, Pat Ryan in one of his dark stoas had this argument that mm -hmm. if you're wondering about UBI, uh, look mm -hmm. at Saudi Arabia. They basically have UBI. If you're a Saudi Arabian citizen and look what happens there. And they also re refer back in the days of Rome that when they give free grain, said they just fucked and drank. So, well, again, I'm not even saying that, you know, maybe, maybe it's even worse. Maybe they don't even, they don't even fucking drink. Maybe they're just depressed. Cool. Next question. Okay. <laughs> Can I sneak a follow up, Raven? Okay. <laughs> Do you know much about Weinstein's like uh, endowed growth obligations theory? And do you have any comments? Or do you don't mind also explaining it to those who don't know? It's certainly worth watching. I'm not sure I'll be doing justice to Eric's thought. I think he is very much worth watching on this topic and Googling it. The claim would be that our institutions were made on the premise of growth. So when you enter one of our institutions, be it an educational institution, an economic institution, you are given an entry position and you are told, look, this isn't forever. You're subordinate right now. And yes, we're kind of exploiting you, but this is where you learn the ropes. And one day you're gonna be like me. This is a lie when told to grad students today. It was not a lie when told to grad students in 1940. In 1940, a grad student could expect maybe to be a professor. Today, they're deluding themselves if they expect to become a professor, right? The ratio is so obscurely like lopsided. There's just such an overproduction of them. So what happens if you have a society where literally all the institutions have these kind of embedded growth obligations where they are promising you, you know, it kind of sucks right now, but you're buying into the system that's going to have beautiful returns. You're going to have a big re retirement. You're going to get promoted. Uh, you know, you go for this education and so on. Like if the growth stops, you might actually have supreme social problems in completely different systems, all hitting at about the same time. Uh, now, very happy to be corrected by others, but this is my, again, attempt. I encourage everyone to go check out Eric Weinstein. His interviews on the portal are wonderful. It's the one, it's the one show I really enjoy watching, so very much recommend it. And I would also make an explicit comparison here to Peter Turchin's elite overproduction thesis, where I think actually where Peter Turchin's thesis shines is if you apply the theory of elite overproduction, it actually fits to a T what's happening in the academic system. And you get a very similar prognosis to the one Eric Weinstein would propose exists there. 
And then also I would, you know, mention empire theory, which is a subset of uh, great founder theory where I also write on a similar dynamic. It's called uh, centralized declining empire is the type of uh, society where I use empire in the technical sense, not in the sense of like the Roman empire or the British empire, but just a zone of coordination. Um, maybe I'll change that terminology. It was a little bit game theory inspired, but like right now, I think you have to be extremely careful with how you name your, your, your pseudo theoretical concepts, right? You have to be careful about that. And, and do you have a reaction to Weinstein's theory? Do you disagree with them in any meaningful ways? Or what do you think he misunderstands? Mm, that's a good question. Um, well, it's always very important to talk to people who have very developed theoretical frameworks and do them justice. If I significantly disagree with Weinstein's, probably I believe much more in uh, tacit knowledge. So it's less resource-based focus in view of the economy, but rather tacit knowledge, intellectual dark matter, essentially. And the failure to transmit that knowledge is being upstream of economic limits, right? And he might view it more like, no, it's the failure to discover new things. And I'm like, no, no, no. I think we're even forgetting how to do some of the old things. Perhaps not where we have like physical artifacts like this microphone, right? Not yet, though sometimes, you know, it took, it took quite a while for the U.S. to figure out how to put a man into space. And arguably it wasn't the U.S., but a South African entrepreneur. Um, and the social technology, right? The social technology stuff I think might be breaking. And I also think not all of our institutions were truly predicated on the embedded growth obligation. So there might be a technical disagreement between us. What share of institutions have this feature? Great. Uh, Key, would you like to ask your question? Hi, Emma. Uh, Hi. Thank you for um, speaking to these topics. And um, my question isn't very well articulated, but I, I would think that the growth aspect kind of plays into the question. Um, I wanted to ask you about your observations on, on violence. Um, when you previously were talking about um, like energy as a resource um, or, you know, the, the domestication piece of it, um, I just wanted to ask you about the, how you differentiate or how you see the differentiation between like offensive violence and defensive violence and how it's related to human nature and ethical actions and culture. Hmm. Ah, it's super difficult, right? It's super difficult because, you know, it's... Um there is something in humanity, there is something in how we are that causes us to seek out violence over and over again. And we are repulsed by it and we hate it, but we also love it. Otherwise, our video games wouldn't be as violent as they are, our movies wouldn't be as violent as they are, our myths wouldn't be as violent as they are, right? And I don't know exactly how that works. And I also think the question of aggression, it's always so, it's so convoluted. There are, we could try to figure out in the primordial sense, who is the first mover of violence? But very soon those calculations become so complicated that it's not clear it's very useful to figure out who started it, right? Perhaps at one point we have to like, just look at us, like look around and be like, okay, this is like a bunch of preschoolers, like, you know, beating each other up. I don't care who started it, right? It's a planet of preschoolers, right? And we could say stop, but then like, you know, you know, if you have to lock them in a classroom to make them stop, I don't know, maybe they were, maybe they were happier out in the grass and in the trees with all the bruises, um, even if they were giving each other those bruises. So I would say that there are some interesting books on this I would possibly recommend without fully endorsing. Um, let me see if I can find it. Uh, like there's an anthropological book. I mean, you know, they're the classical books like Hannah Arendt's stuff on violence. So I think that's like a very ideological one. There's The Better Na Angels of Our Nature by Steven Pinker. Um, there's like stuff, you know, on, you know, revolution, disobedience, the pacifist sort of stuff. 
Um, there is a particular book I'm thinking of that I'm not able to find. So I'm going to tweak a link later to that book and endorse it. And maybe uh, since I think you've been a regular, I think I've seen you to a few of these other ones. If I don't get it today, I'll, you know, drop the link and just mention uh, the book I have in mind that's slipping my mind and like recommended here in addition to the other ones. Thank you. That's really helpful and appreciate it. Yeah. So cool. Twitter, I'll look out for it. <laughs> Thanks. Very welcome. Um, there's kind of interest in the chat on, in a comment that Peter made a little bit back. I don't know if Peter, you want to share your comment and see what Samo thinks of it. Or I can do it too. <laughs> it's pretty. Um, if you want to jump in, you can, but I'm just going to share it. So he's talking about um, in Japanese society how the reward seems to be, and maybe you can help, Anjan, um, uh, energy return on, or the reward seems to be prestige rather than like money itself. Is yes. that some kind of resource? as well that maybe we're losing or don't have as much of in, in the US? Well, it's possible. Um, I think that in the 1950s, for example, right, uh, the salaries of the CEO class were notably lower and company spirit was notably higher. You do realize that like IBM in the 1930s, people would just get together and sing songs about the beloved, beloved president of IBM. Like you can find this song. It's like actually like funny, right? And they would have pictures of like the CEO of the company, like everywhere. Like today, this almost feels like, you know, is this Kim Jong-un or something? No, no, this is just what these big companies were like. So in such a world, well, maybe the CEO doesn't require a salary and doesn't require quite as much because they're already getting paid in status. And, you know, maybe companies are a little bit more like cults than they would be today. Uh, so, you know, Japan, I think, is definitely an example of this. You dedicate yourself to the company, the company takes care of you. The salary differential isn't great, but the deference differential is very great. And I think people can be motivated by social goods at least as much as they can be by material goods. Arguably, a lot of consumerism is, now here's the negative side of consumerism. It's wasteful. It's like, you know, producing substitute goods where you have these material markers. They're supposed to bring you happiness, but they don't. Here's the positive side of it. Um, humans are so social that we just neglect physical fundamentals all the time. But if you kind of convince us to fetishize physical things, we will take care of even the physical things if only to have physical things be a token of our social games. So if you make it so that the like, nice fast car is a status symbol, the nice fast plane is a status symbol, then we will do such an unnatural thing as to learn how to like build the car and build the plane. So it could be that if human nature has perhaps been like, you know, maybe consumerism was like, um, maybe it was an over response and a doubling down on actually something failing, desires not being projected properly, where our desire to engage with the physical world was lessening. And we try to keep touch with physical reality by fetishizing objects. And for a while this worked, but now we've even lost touch with the objects we don't want to even consume anymore. And it's not because we've all become enlightened, but it's because we've like become even more unenlightened. You know, maybe the, the Zen of Karen or something could be an interesting book about that. Like, I don't know. Awesome, great. So we're wrapping up here at the top of the hour. Are there any final words, final thoughts you want to leave us with? Yes, I did ultimately promise I would talk something about refoundings. Um, and what I would cite here is I certainly wouldn't endorse all and every one of these historical figures. They all have issues and they're often pursuing values that I would disagree with and that many in our society would disagree with. But I would consider the case of Justinian, an Eastern Roman emperor who assembled a team of the very greatest experts he could find in all domains from accounting to civil administration to scholarship to law and to military matters, single-handedly turning around the faith of the Eastern Roman Empire, right? So the Greek dominated corner, the Greek speaking part, um, you know, reconquering Southern Spain, North Africa and Italy back into the empire. Arguably Rome didn't fell, 
didn't fall until Constantinople was gone. Like that's an example of individual impact. Another case I would say is that, you know, there's the refounding of Charlemagne in his era where undoubtedly he reforms what's basically a tribal structure and changes it into a proper feudal structure. Now again, tribal versus feudal, I think today people aren't very deeply sympathetic to either of those, but the fact is that was a new civilization, a new society built and created out of this ruins of an old one. And then finally, I would also give um, Augustus. And again, the reason I'm sticking to Western history isn't because, see, Ramses II wouldn't be super good to talk about, or uh, some Chinese emperor wouldn't be a great person to talk about, but it's because these are our cultural touchstones, right? People might know of Justinian of the Eastern Roman Empire, they might know Charlemagne, and they might know of the Emperor Augustus. Um, the Republic was in terminal decline. We can see it as a tragedy that the Republic was dissolved. But by that point, the Republic, you know, the cure was worse than the disease. The Republic was set up to correct a terrible and corrupt monarchy in ancient Rome. And then the uh, sort of Augustan dictatorship, this imperial position of the princeps, the first citizen was set up to correct for a corrupt and decaying Republic. So one could argue that both were progress, right? Both fixed what was broken and fixed what was essentially a tyrannical and extremely violent system. And when you look at the uh, lead emissions and pollution is a tricky sign, but I think the Romans did not invest much in clean energy. So I'm just gonna take uh, lead in the atmosphere in ancient Roman times as preserved in the gas bubbles in Icelandic ice as a good indicator of Roman economic productivity and have something quite unfakeable like how much lead do you mine if we take that as an indicator, lead product, you know, atmospheric lead went up. This means economic activity went up. Civil wars ended for a significant period of time. City, urban populations increased. I think he just did an amazing job of arresting what could have been a terminal decline for that civilization, right? Rome might have been a 600 year civilization instead of a thousand year civilization if it wasn't for him. And again, the key note here would be all of these people did assemble very competent teams of individuals around them, right? Uh, Charlemagne like sponsored the reintroduction of Latin education in the territories that he ruled. He sponsored scholarships, and even though he didn't learn how to read himself, was a great sponsor of those. Uh, Justinian reformed the legal code as did Charlemagne and to a lesser extent Augustus. Uh, they all changed military structures and people miss when someone reforms the military, they never just reform the military they reform all of society. Think of every time you are asked to respect the troops. That's a social technology, right? We can't pretend that the structure of the US military doesn't profoundly shape American society. And, you know, for that matter, things like policing and so on. So, you know, try to find the exceptional people in the world. You don't have to be so megalomaniacal to think you are one of them and try to help them. Okay, that's where I would leave it off for today. Great. Thank you so much, Samo, and looking forward to what you bring for us uh, next week. So, much. yeah, I'm just going to tell us about some upcoming sessions we have here at the STOA. Uh, we have two upcoming sessions that are really about getting into difficult conversation and controversy. The first one is tomorrow, Emotional Dojo with Kira Kroger. That's at 3 p.m. Eastern time. And then we also, the following day, have the Dangerous Space with Ariel Friedman, and that's uh, at 12 p.m. Eastern Time. So join us for those events. I'm also hosting um, Socratic Speed Dating tomorrow. So come join me at 7 p.m. to have some socializing. And we see the STOA as a gift. And if you feel inspired to give a gift in return, you can go ahead and visit us at thestoa.ca slash gift, and you can provide a gift for Samo, for me, for any of the facilitators here at the STOA. We have some in the room here today. So if you feel so inspired, please go ahead and, and visit us at that link. And thank you all for being here today and look forward to seeing you in the future.